So Manuel came to do his PhD uh, working in the Caribbean. He was working in Belize and was one of the first people, I think, to ever quantify the population dynamics of sponges, as well as some of the ecological interactions of this group. And, uh, and his work was both empirical, um, it had experimental components to it, field experiments, as well as some, some modeling work that he did. Uh, after his, his PhD, he came to, or during his PhD, he moved to Brisbane. He then did a postdoc with Ove Goldberg's group, working on leading the Catlin Seaview survey, which allowed him to get up and down the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and of course, pioneering the use of some of these clever three-dimensional camera systems. Um, and I think that may in part have led to him uh, getting appointed back to Ames. And he's gonna be talking to, today about you know, how we use technology to make a lot more from coral reef monitoring. So uh, he's a, a terrific uh, researcher and it's a pleasure to introduce him. Take it away, Manny. Uh, thanks a lot, Pete. Um, and, and thanks a lot to uh, to the Center of Excellence. I really appreciate the opportunity, and, and, and very especially thank you to you to allow me in your computer and talking a little bit more about the work that we're doing. Um, so, I the, the chat that we have today is is mainly around um, the challenges that we're facing in terms of the changes that are happening in ecological systems and how important monitoring is to actually support decision making but also talking a little bit about the challenges and how sort of technology can actually um, sort of lead the way or help us in, in overcoming some of those challenges. So uh, today, the, the talk that I want to go through you today is, is, is outlining different, uh, different topics. Some of those are gonna be starting very broadly about sort of the challenges of, of ecological change as a wicked problem in society and conservation. Um, we dive a little bit more in detail about sort of why, why monitoring is essential and what are the challenges in there and bring a little bit of the idea that um, machine learning at the moment is actually emerging as a technology that can help us sort of making some decisions faster and probably more efficiently um, in these very uncertain times. And then specifically, I, I'll try to um, outline this within the context of a new project that we started, it's called Rift Cloud as a sort of a vision to, to help us sort of reaching the, the potential of technology in, in a way that is very tailored to conservation. And um, perhaps more importantly, just discussing a little bit about sort of where this project is going and how, how can we um, work together in terms of collaboration. Um, so the, the, the reason why I'm calling the ecological change a wicked problem is that because we are actually um, we, we all know right now that systems, in particular coral reef, are actually under a lot of pressure. Uh, so that's not news to us, and it, we know that, that systems are changing very dramatically. But there is a bit of there is a complexity on the line this that makes a very complex problem to be able to to that that is very difficult to address that through traditional conservation practices. Um, just let me dive a little more in detail into why why we think this is a wicked problem. Um, and if we all sort of acknowledge that then sort of systems are changing very dramatically, I don't need necessarily to enter into that, that level of detail, but I wanna step back and sort of talk about sort of why changes in the ecosystem are actually pushing our boundaries in humanity. Um, so if we, if we look at um, the, the planetary boundaries, which is an approach that um, the Stockholm Resilience Center have been uh, driving alongside with the university, the Australian University of um, the, the ANU. So the, the approach is that if we consider the space in which humanity can operate and, and sustain over a long time, there's a strong dependency with the environment. And as the environment changes, it does changes or increases the risk of where humanity can actually live. And by analyzing the different dimensions of the environmental services that um, in which humanity actually has a strong relationship what what this group have actually uh, come up with is this diagram that's called um, the planetary boundaries that are outlining in different axes or dimensions what uh, uh, what place or how close we are to actually reaching our boundaries and as we can see um, in these dimensions the the biochemical flows and what they call the biosphere integrity, so 
a bit more specifically about biodiversity is actually already reaching and surpassing our, our boundaries. And that poses a lot of risk about what, how the system's gonna look in the future, how, how, how risky is our, our uh, the, the, the way how we operate as a humanity on Earth and, and also sort of how, how much changes are we expecting to happen if we keep going in that direction. So certainly changes do have a strong relationship to, to the way how we live and the way, the way how we operate. And if we keep going in the same direction, obviously that, will, that, that is already impacting uh, the way how we live and it will be more dramatically impacted that in the future. So the changes that we actually see in the ecosystems are, um, are part of a wicked problem because of many different dimensions that are adding complexity to it. So one of the main um, challenges that we see, uh, particularly in the recent decades to a century, is that the, the rate at which this, these changes are occurring is increasing over time and increasing to a point that is almost unmanageable. The, what I'm showing here is just two different graphs um, that, that outline a little bit the, the idea that systems are actually changing really, really quick. On the left, I'm showing the, the cumulative percentage of a species that are driven to extinct over time and different, different figures or different colors show the different groups. And what, what is important to say is that from the beginning of the century, we, we have seen quite dramatic loss of species on Earth. And that's, that's actually continuously increasing. It has in plateaued. And then the other, and the other graph on the right hand side, what I'm showing is also that uh, if we sort of consider this from the, the risk of survival, um, so many, many species, or many groups of species are already sort of on the, on the worst conditions. And some of those like corals are actually dramatically changing over time. So the rate at which these changes are occurring in our ecosystem poses a lot of concerns about how, how can we manage systems that are changing so dramatically and so, so rapidly. The other point that makes this a wicked problem is also the high dimensionality of, of the changes that are occurring. So there, there is plenty of evidence in science that the, it's not just biodiversity we're losing, but there is a cascading effect um, from biodiversity that sort of translates in many different changes from many different dimensions within the complexity of nature. And just to give you just a handful of examples, not to go into the details. Um, what I'm showing you here is some of the work that Emily Darwin and colleagues have done, um, looking at how over time, the composition of, of coral communities have actually uh, shifted to, towards more stress dominant um, or, or tolerant species. And, and it's not necessarily um, a, the, the shift, but also the dominance of different species and how how um, also the levels of fished um, and unfished uh, effects can actually have on the dynamics of the systems. So there's, there's a shift in the community composition, there's a shift in the, the turnover of species, um, but also uh, some of the work that uh, Juan Carlos Ortiz have done as well is showing that it's not only just the, the turnover of species, but also cascade into how, how a species responds to change and how do they recover. So the, this graph here just showing the, the, the growth rate of, of corals, um, of, of coral reef in after disturbance over time. And what we're seeing is that um, after a point, sort of the, the capacity of a system to actually recover is, is just slowing down. And that's not only just shown for our species, it's shown for many, many others. Um, and another example of this, and this is only just one of the many, is that um, the capacity of coral reef to accrete on growth has, is also sort of predicted to be reduced over time. And what we're showing here is just a graph um, from Molika et al. in 2018 that shows that those areas in red are those where, where actually the accretion or the growth rate of paritis is actually uh, predicted to be, to be declined. And sort of the more red there is, the worse the scenario is, and the greener it is, the, the better it is. So you can see that uh, in general, there's quite a strong pattern um, towards a decline of accretion in, in coral reef. And uh, many others, sort of fish um, tropicalization uh, in, in 
in temporary environments. So there's a number of changes that are happening, but in many different directions that makes it, makes it a complex problem. Um, and probably linked to also that dimensionality and, and grade is that many reef are actually, or, or our capacity to predict or to summarize this is, is hindered by the complexity, not only of the system itself, but the way how we measure. Um, so you, here what I'm showing is that th there is a strong uncertainty in our predictions or our observations of change. Um, but it's also a variable response and number of pressures that are actually acting of, on, on ecosystem, particularly in coral reef around the world. So it's not a single problem of like um, a single part of the reef or every, every single reef reacting in the same way. But many reef are actually changing um, in uncertain trajectories and also uh, subject to very different intensities of variables and pressures that are actually driving these changes. And on top of that sort of layers of complexity that sort of involve ecological changes and the impact on, on, on the way how we live, uh, there's also reinforcing cycles, cycles that um, are actually uh, impairing in such a way the conservation actions. So on one side, what I'm showing here is that societal changes, so our population growth, the way how we actually um, do what we do in terms of our activities drive development, exploitation, and climate change. This is the strongly linked there, and, and our actions are actually driving a lot of changes um, that are actually translating into ecosystem change. So the, the increase in the growth rate of our populations and our activities are actually driving more and more changes in our ecosystems. They're in turn actually to affect the, the services the ecosystem provides back to us as a humanity. So as I showed in the, in the planetary boundaries, the, the idea is that the, this is an endless loop where the more actually we enforce changes in, in the ecosystem, the more actually going to impair the way how we live and the more we're going to have to adapt to it. So it's a, it's a cycle there. Um, but in the, on the other side, when, when the ecosystem changes at the pace that it's actually changing, uh, it's put, putting a lot of pressure on, the, on our capacity as scientists to actually assess the change and to um, generate insights so in the end uh, are, is the information that we use to, to not only just to create awareness in the public, but also to make, to make decisions about it. So the faster the changes are occurring and the more complex they are, the more actually this drive um, a, 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 a difficult situation for, for us as a scientist to assess the change and to provide the right sort of set of tools and information to manage um, those changes in for, for a better way um, and, and to support the, the, the livelihood of our communities as well as the ecosystem. So all of these sort of reinforces that um, the, the idea of, of ecological monitoring or environmental monitoring as a tool or backbone for decision support. So what, I, what I'm showing you here is just the, the classic Gibson framework that just simply illustrate that the, our decisions and our, our conservation actions are driven by a number of elements and they're all acting together. So by measuring and understanding what the drivers, the pressures and the state of ecosystems are, uh, we can understand what the impacts those are for, for our values and, and our, our own sustainability as humans, and then drive uh, responses in terms of the conservation actions or the policy making that act that should enforce or, or, or control or ameliorate the changes that are happening in the ecosystem. So being a circle, what this allows us is actually to uh, re-evaluate and audit our own actions to be able to, to, to drive better conservation practices and be adapted to, to the changes that are occurring. And, and monitoring in this particular case becomes quite essential to, to understand how general are those drivers, pressures, and the state, and then what, how our conservations are actually impacting um, the, the trajectory of the different ecosystems. But of course, nothing is perfect, and there's always challenges um, uh, in terms of coral reef monitoring. 
But what I wanted to highlight as well is that there are really good opportunities emerging and um, I want to build a case for it. So in terms of the challenges, um, you, you probably are quite familiar that monitoring as an exercise is quite an expensive one. Um, it's expensive and often um, institutions are actually resource limited to, to produce um, the, the quality and the, ex, the extent and, the, and the, um, the um, rate of production of knowledge that uh, we, we need. And that's actually increasing over time as our system are actually changing. Um, the, the other challenge is that monitoring itself requires a lot of expertise. So they, it requires expertise that goes in different fields from taxonomy to ecology to um, conservation planning to, to data analysis. So this different expertise uh, or, or this level of expertise and diversity of expertise also drive a lot of the cost of these programs. Um, but also when, when we come out, when we talk about um, large areas like the Great Barrier Reef or even the entire world, there are inconsistencies in the formats in which we store our data and, and analyze it. That makes it very difficult and a very lengthy project process to, to go to, towards the integration of monitoring and make more conclusive decisions about what can we do and, and how, how efficient are our conservation practices. Um, the, the other one is also that and it's probably very much related to the expertise, is that differences in, in the capabilities of, of, of us as a monitoring scientist to, to analyze and to assess the condition of the reef and given the complexity of, of those changes. Um, the differences can actually drive strong bias in our data, which make it very difficult for us to actually really integrate different data sets coming from different, different organizations or, or, or different parts of the world. And lastly, also related to it is that we, we do have a, a myriad of methods to assess change and, and that's constantly evolving. But because of that differences in the sampling design of different monitoring programs, it becomes challenging to actually really do a, 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 an integration that really makes, makes the most of data sets to, to make informed decisions out of the, the insights that we generate. So there's, there's, a, there's a layer of complexity um, that are but quite generic in terms of monitoring, but this is particularly relevant in coral reef where the accessibility to coral reef is fairly limited and, um, and, and that sort of a, a accelerate a lot of these, these challenges. And uh, when we put it all together thinking about, well, if we want to actually really make decisions that are uh, across geographies and that are comparable, there, there are actually um, higher level challenges like well, the, the data readiness for monitoring is, is actually quite hinder, hindered by, by those other challenges that I mentioned before. The rate at which we actually are capable to generate it inside a knowledge that actually inform the changes is, is actually being impaired, particularly because of the, the rate at which changes are occurring. So that the timing is actually quite crucial and we, all the changes are happening and, and the, the, the cost and and the complexity of coral reef monitoring becomes really difficult to actually make, make um, generate the insights at the right time. Um, and the other part is also data availability. Our, our monitoring data is actually extremely useful also, not just for the reporting uh, on the condition of the reef and the pressures, but also to actually uh, drive innovation in terms of science and what the potential solutions to that. And lastly, because of all these um, other elements associated to monitoring, the longevity of our data cut is actually severely impaired. And in many cases, we, it's very rare actually to have long-term data sets that help, you, help us explaining not just the response of ecosystem to certain pressures, but the long-term trends um, that are happening in these ecosystems. But not everything is doom and gloom. I mean, there's a lot of changes that are happening. The ecosystems are complex in terms of how they react. But they, there is quite a lot of uh, good opportunities to, to leverage in the existing efforts. Um, the, in this map, what I'm showing is um, the amount of coral reef monitoring happening around the world. And this is probably a figure that is not actually the most updated one, but it does show that um, about 70% of our coral reef bioregions are being monitored. And it does show those that, that 
there are differences in the intensity of monitoring happening around the world, but, but in overall, we do have quite a good coverage of coral reef around the world in terms of the, our, our, our monitoring efforts. And also there's, there's uh, a global coral reef monitoring network that sort of serves as an infrastructure and a platform that, that accelerates our, our integration, our capacity to collaborate, to do, to do more out of the monitoring to inform better decision making. The other opportunity or, or I guess benefit as well is that we've been, um, over the last 10 years probably or more, uh, images have been quite commonly adopted in many monitoring programs. And so the photograph of the ventus are actually really good for um, capturing a lot of data uh, in, in a very short period of time, and then allows it to, allow us to, to analyze that later when we have a little bit more time to, to get more and more information. And images also um, contain a wealth of information. They're not just um, to estimate coral cover, but we, we, we can get a lot out of the images that sort of allows us to actually explore the, the different, the complexity in which systems are, are, are changing. And, uh, and it's also um, a method that perhaps doesn't require a, a quite specialized training in, the, in, in terms of the collection of the data once you are in the field, but it does require that later on we do have the capacity to analyze it in, in the formats that are consistent. And the, the third part that I wanted to talk to you, and it's probably more, more, more relevant to this, to this discussion, is also the technology. Um, I couldn't help myself to actually bring this one. Uh, the, 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 the capacity or, or the accessibility of technology is becoming a lot more, uh, a lot easier to, to get access to, a lot cheaper, and, and, and in many different formats. So what it was probably, almost impossible a few years ago, it's becoming really, really tangible than now. And the other point is the diversity of emerging tools that are coming in. And one of the tools that I want to talk to you is, is particularly the automation part of, of the image analysis, which is one of the bottlenecks that, um, that are actually hindering our process uh, and our effectiveness in terms of generating insight for, from monitoring. So let me just, um, then dive very specifically into, into this topic about machine learning. Um, and, uh, and what I'm hoping to get here is, is rather than to get into the details about what machine learning is, is try to build, build a little bit of case of existing publications and, and existing efforts to demonstrate that this is actually quite a, quite a promising tool that is, is emerging and it, even if it has been out there for quite a while, the demonstrations of the applications for coral reef monitoring are actually becoming increasingly uh, more, more abundant in the literature now. So what is machine learning? I mean, I, I guess we all sort of hear about machine learning or artificial intelligence in, in many parts. And in, in reality, machine learning has been in, in our society for quite a long time. And, and sort of probably the most popular ones are the face recognition. Um, or, or actually nowadays it's self-driving cars. The machine learning in general um, is a field within the computer science groups that are, are sort of tailored to specifically to, to get computers to be able to learn to task without being necessarily being programmed for those tasks. So to do, to do tasks that not necessarily you have to, to code um, the response of the machine, but the machine being able to actually um, make decisions. And more generally, when we talk about artificial intelligence, um, which is quite, quite a, there's quite a lot of similarities in, in the topics, we, we talked about specifically about the, 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 the machines to be able to actually make decisions that actually help us accomplish a task a lot faster. And why, why this is relevant for coral reef? Well, the way how we, how we assess um, how the condition of the coral reef is if we use images is to actually lay points in the image. And there's a traditional method called the, the point cloud method, um, which is widely used to only just in coral reef. And the idea is that if you take enough points in an image and you identify what's underlying that point, then you will be able to estimate what's the percentage cover of different groups in there. So they give you an information about the composition and the condition of the reef. 
Um, but as you can see, and you, many of you probably know, um, just going through many points in the image is quite, quite a tedious exercise. And it's not, um, it's, it's not a trivial exercise because it does require that you, you pay enough attention to identify the different um, groups that are in, this, in these images. The way how we think that machine learning can actually be useful here is, is based on an approach called the deep learning. And deep learning is using convolutional networks. So these are neural networks that are actually um, interlinked um, methods to assess different parameters within the image. And we're talking about probably uh, millions of features that are extracted from different spatial scales within the image. So if, you, if you're talking here, the image within the car, for instance, the, the, the neural networks are intended to actually go through a moving window in that image and start extracting different features that some of which um, towards the right hand side are kind of like pointless or, or, or less, less obvious to us. And then towards the left hand side of the, of, of the convolutional network networks, it starts sort of resembling a little bit more the car. And the idea of the neural networks is that by extracting all these different features and weighing the connections in between these different features, the machine starts learning what different parameters really are making this picture to be actually classified as a coral. So in the end, the machine goes through thousands of iterations to actually calibrate all these relationships in between different parameters to, to be able to come up with a, distribution of probabilities is what's the most likely uh, label that we can assign to this. So it learns from the initial training, it weights the parameters that, that are actually the most important ones to, to define this, this classification as a car, and in the end it produces um, a value that says, well, hey, this is the one that I think is the most likely to be. In the in the car reef space again, if we actually look at our images from the left hand side, where there's a tr traditional image from, from monitoring and related points, we can actually classify those points manually and run it through a very complex network, uh, which is what I'm illustrating in the middle, that actually has a lot of connections in many different directions that trying to understand what is it that defines this particular coral to be classified like that. And in the end of that process, through many, many iterations, it actually come out with a probability that, well, this is the coral that I think it is, um, and these are the other options. So it, the machine can do this really fast, and it, it looks at ex, and explore different connections that is actually not that intuitive to us, but it, in the end, actually come out and do a really good job. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about why, why I think it's doing a, a really good job. Um, what I wanted to show here is a few examples from different um, papers or, or different projects uh, that are actually trying to compare how well the machine is working. So this graph here is just showing in the x-axis what we as a scientist uh, assign as, as the percentage cover for, for an image and, and in the y-axis where the machine, um, what the machine is predicting it to be. So that diagonal dotted line that I show in gray in the background is, is the identity line. So ideally, what we want is all these points to be actually really as close as possible to that center of the, of the point. So it does show that the, the, the machine can go through the image and produce really accurate values of, of coral cover estimations. Um, another work that's done by Williams um, and, and colleagues in Hawaii is that they look at similar ways to analyze or, or compare the performance of the machines against um, our uh, own observations as, as experts. And they look at this in Hawaii uh, with the NOAA Coral Reef Monitoring Program. And they, again, they compare um, the human against the machine and they found that the, the trends are actually pretty consistent. They, they, the machine does with it for really well. Um, but it's not just coral cover. Like if you look at the differences between those points and the identity line, so um, more or less like the receivables, and we can see that this as the, as the absolute difference between what is the absolutely best estimation and what the machine does. Um, what I'm showing you here is 
is that value, the mean absolute error of the machine predictions, for different functional groups, not only just um, in Australia, like in blue, but also across different regions. This is part of a work that we did with the University of Queensland in um, the, the, the Kathleen CV survey program. And we collected images from all around the world in about 50 or something countries. And then we tried to compare how consistent is the machine in estimating the percentage cover. And what this graph shows is that there is variation among the estimation of functional groups. But generally speaking, the differences between uh, the machine and what we as observers can say is about three to five percent. And this is an absolute difference. So if we're talking about an uh, estimation of 30 percent, the machine can say 35 or machine, uh, machine 25. But there's a range of variation in which the machine can actually estimate the values. Uh, and that's the confluence of that. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to end in just predicting color cover or high level functional groups. Um, the machines can actually also dive a little more in detail and often do a better job in actually um, narrowing down the classification to, to a much um, higher resolution in terms of the taxonomy or the functional taxonomy. So what I'm showing here is the same kind of graph uh, for some of the work that we're doing with the long-term monitoring program where we're comparing what the machine predicts in the y-axis and what, what we, as, a, as, as the monitors, on the, uh, are actually predicting from those images. So it does show that there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of uh, similarities in, in terms of the coral cover prediction for different groups, like a, a crop rot tabular at the top, coral in algae, or some, some groups like Pavides that are, are grouped into encrusting massive and submassive. Um, also, the soft corals, uh, particularly family Alcyonidae. So the machine it does predict that there is there is variability in some of the groups, um, and and the ones that actually doesn't do really well <laughs> is the turf algae. So um, the turf algae is one of the most challenging ones for for the machine to really capture. And although it does capture the trends, it doesn't necessarily capture the actual values of it. And the reason for that is that uh, I think that there, there is different approaches when it comes to identification of turf algae with, the, with this machine learning approach because turf is a lot more heterogeneous visually. Um, it's a, it's the, the changes are occurring on much smaller scales. And uh, also, it's probably one of the categories that encompass the most variability in many other, uh, 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 among many other classes. So there are approaches that we're working at the moment to, to deal with that variability. Um, but yeah, but at the moment, it's, it's one of the weakest link of the, of the machine learning. Um, and I, I don't pretend that you read this long list, but what I wanted to actually say is that it's not also just this category. The machine does a really good job across the board. And, and this is just a, a list of uh, different categories that we use in the long-term monitoring program to assess the efficiency of the machine. Um, and it, generally speaking, with the exception of turf algae, it's actually working with a, an error of about two to three percent. Um, but another point also to actually evaluate how well this, these technologies are um, for, for helping us in monitoring is to compare how, uh, how compatible is the estimation to coral cover to our legacy data, because one of the key elements of monitoring is actually the longevity of the temporal series. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is the estimations of coral cover from, from machine annotated images compared to different monitoring programs. And this is, this is a bit more of a comparison between the, the Kathleen um, project, where we, we collected data in, similar, in the same areas where the different monitoring programs around the world are working. And what it shows in the different colors are different regions where we did this comparison um, and different programs based by the shapes. And it does, this, it does show that the, the machine is capable of maintaining uh, a, a, a quite strong relationship to the, to the archives from, from previous years done uh, in a manual way. If we, if we actually dive a little more deeper into this, um, key for us as a, as a scientist is to understand that the machine do have uh, a comparable power of detecting change. So if we analyze the power 
of, of change detection um, over different effect sizes in terms of the size of the change in coral cover. What, what this shows is that the triangles is the machine and the circles is the, um, is the estimation from, from manual annotations. And they show that there's actually a pretty, pretty strong alignment between the two methods to detect change. And if we were to reverse that curve and look at that in terms of the number of samples that are required to achieve different size effects, then, then we do see that actually the patterns are maintained. Um, so there, there are more, many multiple angles in which to evaluate how well the machine works. But if we go back again to, um, to the idea that the systems are not only just changing based on the, compos on the coral cover, but also compositional changes, what we wanted to see here is whether there are similarities in the composition of the communities um, of those estimated by the machine and those estimated by the human. And the, the rationale of this was that, well, perhaps the machine can actually overestimate or underestimate rare species. And if we were to actually um, unbalance our estimations of, of community composition, then we're actually going to end up in very wrong directions of, uh, of using the data for monitoring. So this graph, what it does show is the Brackle Curtis similarity index um, in, a, in a pairwise comparison between the machine and the human in different parts of the world. So we did it in the Atlantic, in Australia, in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific, in Southeast Asia, but also within different, different countries within those. And what it shows is that, generally speaking, there's about a 80 to 90% agreement between what the machine is saying in terms of the composition and what the humans are saying. Um, and lastly, the, the last point I wanted to also mention is that well, we, we can get really good results um, for one of comparison, but is the machine really capable of actually following co trends in coral cover? So we can really pick what, what's actually changing in that system. So this graph shows you the, um, the long-term monitoring program uh, data from, from the Captain Convergence, particularly Lady Masbray really. And it shows how the changes have dramatic, have been dramatic changes in coral cover over time, but a very strong recovery. And what, what we wanted to see if that if the machine depicted in red can capture the same trends. So there are differences in the estimations of it, uh, in some cases overestimated. But one of the important things is that we can actually detect those changes in a similar fashion. We are actually doing better at, uh, uh, accounting and, and, and improving those changes, but generally speaking, the machine does actually detect really good uh, the temporal changes and happening in far away. If we look at this from on a different perspective and say, well, how much actually really cost us and how efficient is this method, given that it goes through 40 million parameters to really assess what we probably look and probably will do a lot faster. So we wanted to do to compare the efficiency and, and, and the cost of, of using these, these methods. And then in, in the first panel on the left, what I show you is the comparison between manual and annotation approaches for, for analyzing images. And if we do all that in a cloud system, what would be the cost of it? So the cost can actually vary because depending on what part of the world you are, the salary cost will be different. But essentially what we're seeing here is that there is a contrasting difference in, in how much does it actually cost to process one single image um, where, where probably in, in the automated space, it can, we're talking about cents when, when we're actually talking about dollar figures in, um, in doing manually. And, and similarly, on the middle panel, I'm showing that um, the number of images that the machine can go through in an hour is a lot faster. So um, the machine can go over, um, 1,200 images in a, in, a, in a single hour, where, where for us, uh, it takes us a fair bit of time to, to really go through each of the images. So there's a contrasting difference in the productivity that obviously drive the cost of analyzing this. Um, and then when we compare overall the differences in terms of the estimation for different functional groups or, or, or taxonomic groups um, between the human 
oh, sorry, within the human, so the variability among us as observers, and then compare that with the machine, which is what I'm showing you in the right-hand uh, um, plot, is, is actually fairly comparable. Obviously, we are humans, and we're going to make um, decisions or in, in terms of the annotation that will introduce uh, variation to the estimations. But the, those variations are actually within the same range in which the machine can actually replicate our observation. Um, so the argument that I'm trying to make is that, well, automation technologies are not necessarily perfect, but they actually do a pretty good job. And, and machine learning is not necessarily thought to replace our, our capacity as a scientist to do the job, but rather to actually help us sort of tailor or, or, or invest our efforts in the, in the most appropriate way so we actually do more of what we're actually meant to do, that is the analysis and interpretation of the results. On the other hand, so we think that machine learning has actually reached quite a lot of maturity to be able to support error rate monitoring. Um, and if we carefully applied and sort of we define objective the technology, then that can actually help us to build more efficiency in our, our monitoring around the world and sort of therefore cascading into the effects of decision making. So that, that actually in the end sort of lead me towards where, where, where are we actually um, heading? And one of the challenges that we see is that that technology is not necessarily um, fully available or actually really much tailored to, to the monitoring. So we need to do a bit of more work in, in making that connection happen. And, and that's part of what, where we're heading at the moment is trying to operationalize and innovate in, in the use of the technology in this project called RiffCloud to try to actually build more um, capacity for us as scientists around the world and homogenize our efforts to make the most about integrating our, our efforts around the world. So RiffCloud is, is, a, is an online platform that we're creating that make use of the technology, make use of data standardization protocols, the statistics for actually synthesizing those results. And in the end, it's an aim to actually complete in the loop between the data we collect in the field all the way to the actual reporting. And it's part of a much more, um, it's, it's part of a very strong collaboration around many of us from different organizations around the world. And it's being supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs in, in, in Australia. And if we go back again to that circles or reinforcing loops that I mentioned before, the intention is that with Rift Cloud, we should actually help standardize in that performance, be more efficient in our image analysis, innovate in the synthesis and the visualization of our data. So therefore we can make data more readily available. And, if, and, and sort of promote an effective communication that in the end should actually support um, our, our actions in, in, in advising decision making. And briefly, the, the concept of it is that if we as a community around the world uh, will be able to actually make advantage of an online system that allows to actually wrangle data to uh, automate the analysis and to bring um, quality control and a statistical synthesis out of that, then we will be able to actually get direct benefits as sort of availability of data, probably dive deeper into the analysis and, and also get more synthesis out of that data. That in the end is intended to actually go into a dashboard that meant to actually communicate back um, the results from monitoring. Um, just, just briefly here, I'm just giving you a few snapshots of the system as it is at the moment. We are in a beta version. Um, but it does build to point annotation, as I, as I mentioned before, allows you to, to uh, annotate data differently um, in, in different, with different categories. It allows you to explore the data to, to actually uh, run quality control checks in there. Um, it does actually sim simplify the way how we, we manage our data, so where we collect it, and allows you to actually control a little bit more the, the, uh, the the standards for, for metadata within monitoring. And in the end, it's intended to actually uh, report back the results, not only for us internally, about what's the condition of the RIP, but also to facilitate the communication of our results in monitoring. But lastly, then, the, the point 
is that for us to actually build something that is purposeful um, and it really actually captures the, the complexity of monitoring and, and the way how we actually survey and assess, we, uh, we're very much interested in actually building a stronger collaborations. So what I invite you to is to have a look at, at this webpage with cloud.ai, have a look at how play around and, and maybe reach out if you want to actually um, be part of it. Thank you.